Okay, first, thank you to Oksana and Artemi and Olga. I don't know if she's in here for, for this wonderful invitation and for all the help getting here. It's been it's magnificent, really. Um, uh, so, I'm going to talk about uh, the problem, I guess one of the problems that Artemi alluded to, which is like the problem of energy extraction and the problem that it poses particularly for the political left. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, Canada, where I come from, as a kind of example to illustrate some of these ideas. I'll talk about other places a little bit as well. But my hope is that this might um, kind of exemplify, this might provide some concrete grounds on which I might exemplify this problem that extraction poses for the left elsewhere as well. Uh, so I want to start with that. Um, so that's, uh, I am not an environmentalist. That's a uh, striking declaration, I think. Uh, it's not mine. It's, it's particularly striking because it comes from um, arguably one of the world's most influential contemporary environmentalists, uh, another Canadian, uh, Naomi Klein, whose book This Changes Everything, uh, Capitalism Versus the Climate, has kind of galvanized at least one uh, part of the global climate change movement. Now, this statement uh, by Klein comes uh, not at a massive rally of environmental activists, as she often speaks to, but rather at the founding convention of something called UNIFOR, which is Canada's largest trade union uh, that was forged by the merger of the Canadian auto workers and the Canadian energy and paper workers, uh, two unions whose members' uh, livelihoods have historically been bound up uh, very closely with minerals and energy extraction. Uh, and uh, she continues uh, as follows. She says, I have spent my adult life fighting for economic justice inside our country and between countries. I opposed the WTO not because of its effects on dolphins, but because of its effects on people. The case I want to make to you is that climate change, when its full economic and moral implications are understood, is the most powerful weapon progressives have ever had in the fight for equality and social justice. I'm not calling on you to drop anything. Far from trumping other issues, climate change vindicates much of what the left has been demanding for decades. The climate, change cri the climate crisis requires that we break every rule in the free market playbook. The battle lines have never been clearer. Climate change is a tool. Pick it up and use it. Use it to demand the seemingly impossible. That's what she says. So the seemingly impossible to which uh, Klein points is presumably a fundamental transformation of capitalism, uh, perhaps even its demise. Uh, in this speech, she uh, explicitly invokes the climate crisis and anti-extractivist environmentalism as instrumental to the workers' struggle against capitalism, or at least against its neoliberal variant. And at the same time, the fact of her appeal to unionized workers seems to suggest that she's also trying to persuade them, in their numbers and in their organization, uh, of the broader imperative of arresting climate change against the self-interest that many of them would identify with continuation of the extractive economy on which uh, their livelihoods and their lifestyles has traditionally relied. Uh, elsewhere, uh, in other places, she has said that the fight to stop global warming can only succeed as part of a larger struggle against capitalism. And in yet other contexts, and in the latter stages of her book, she makes the case for an alternative to extractive capitalism that would avert the climate crisis by appealing to indigenous worldviews and practices like uh, uh, practices concerning respect for the land, careful stewardship, the deep relationality of human and non-human things. It would appear, after all, the dolphins do matter to her. <laughs> um, in sum, she appears to be hailing an anti-capitalist political subject in opposition on a variety of grounds to the material foundation of resource economies. So, I should say something now about extractivism. Uh, 
Extractivism refers to the organization of an economy around the large-scale extraction of what are variously called staples or raw materials, natural resources, primary resources, which are then exported from the point of extraction for value-added processing elsewhere. These materials include minerals, metals, fossil fuels, as well as biological resources, including vegetal uh, material, timber, cotton, spices, grains, pulses, and animal flesh as well. Historically, imperialism, colonialism, and slavery have been systems of large-scale extractivism organized around the systematic confiscation of lands, organized theft of resources, and forced dislocation or extermination of people and other species. And extractivism continues to this day in what are called resource economies, with many of these same characteristics, both within industrial countries, as well as at their behest in the so-called periphery. All right. So that's extractivism. It was really uh, John Locke, I think, the great ideologist John Locke, who long before Marx's account of primitive accumulation saw that extraction itself was the condition of possibility for capitalism. For Locke, extraction, in this case styled as plantation, uh, is what made the enclosure and unlimited accumulation of private property not just morally defensible, but virtuous. Because through enclosure and extraction, proprietors were adding to, not subtracting from, the common stock of nature. As Locke put it in the second treatise, he who appropriates land to himself by his labor does not lessen but increases the common stock of mankind. For the provisions serving to the support of human life produced by one acre of enclosed and cultivated land are 10 times more than those which are yielded by an acre of land of an equal richness lying waste in common. And therefore he that encloses land and has a greater plenty of conveniences of life from 10 acres than he could have from 100 left to nature may truly be said to give 90 acres to mankind. A famous passage from Locke from the second treatise. For the capitalist, there is a kind of giving in taking. Right? Crucially though, uh, what permits unlimited accumulation of property is not increasing return of value to the common, but fungibility. The ability to convert extractive yields into, durable, into the durable and hoardable form of money. And so the way for enclosure, for private property, for wage labor, in short, for capitalism, was paved by an argument on behalf of extraction. Locke's labor theory, it could be argued, was really, in a way, an ideology of extractivism. Uh, now, those who live in resource economies or on the peripheries of neo-imperialist or neo-colonial networks of extraction don't need uh, Locke or Marx to understand that primitive accumulation and resource extraction remain structural attributes of national and transnational capitalist economies. Klein's kind of wager is that anti-extractivism, particularly in relation to fossil fuel extraction, might suture the otherwise distinct interests of environmentalists, indigenous peoples, and working people uh, in resource economies and kind of gather them to a social movement that will press for transformative social change. And I think, uh, I think that the materialism of this appeal is, is significant and bears noting. Uh, in a context where for several decades most critical political energy has been devoted to cultivating subjects oriented by the wrong of exclusion, right? a wrong whose remedy, inclusion, can be progressively accommodated within the structure of capitalist power. Right? In that context, right, this turn to the material basis of capitalist power is quite striking, I think. Extraction is more like exploitation and less like exclusion in this respect. Right? You can't do away with it without transformative material consequences for the organization of economic life. Opposition to extraction is potentially radical in just this way. It goes to the root of the capitalist economy. But the question remains, I think, as to whether this potential is real or imagined. Klein and others uh, are 
clearly attempting to kind of hail an anti-extractivist political subject that might carry a political movement for fundamental transformation of the structure of capitalist resource economies. Their wager is that if they call out, hey you there, anti-extractivists, uh, people will turn around and become subjects of extraction, subjects who might then be enlisted in some kind of historical movement. Uh, and this hail has been uh, made explicit um, in a recent initiative spearheaded by Naomi Klein and, another, and a number of other notable Canadians called the Leap Manifesto. They even have a manifesto, uh, which begins, uh, well, it's, it's now been signed by about 30,000 Canadians, uh, time to coincide with the election that we just had. And this Leap Manifesto uh, begins by asserting that Canada is facing the deepest crisis in recent memory. Uh, this crisis has three dimensions, uh, kind of the violence uh, of its settler colonial past, which is in many ways ongoing, enacted against the country's indigenous peoples, growing levels of poverty and inequality in its resource-based economy, and uh, what they describe as the crime against the future, that is anthropogenic climate change, to which Canada's fossil fuel industries make a serious contribution. Now the premise of the Leap Manifesto is that these elements of the current crisis originate in the extractivism at the core of Canada's economy, whose, harm, uh, whose harms generate these three constituencies, kind of indigenous communities, workers, and environmentalists who together might be brought into opposition to this economy. It also, this appeal also proposes uh, that anti-extractivism can serve as the foundation for a fully transformed economy and society. This is the leap that they have in mind. The leap to a decentralized, democratically owned and operated energy system based on 100% renewable resources. So as this leap manifesto puts it, power generated in this way will not merely light our homes but redistribute wealth, deepen our democracy, strengthen our economy, and start to heal the wounds that date back to this country's founding. So here, extractivism is presented as a kind of Ranciarian wrong, right, upon which a politics of contention might be staged, a politics of a party to the existing order and a politics of a party with no part in that order, or as Marx described long ago, a politics of two great hostile camps two classes directly facing each other that will end either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes, right? And this is my question. Can extractivism, as suggested by the Leap Manifesto, summon the political subject of a historically transformative class struggle, extractivists versus anti-extractivists? So this is a very interesting question to which I have really no definitive answer. Um, well, because, of course, only history can answer such questions. Uh, but instead, what I want to do in the time that I have left is kind of explore what I see as some of the complexities that might trouble this proposition, uh, organized roughly in terms of the three dimensions of the anti-extractivist hail or wager, which I'll loosely call the economic dimensions, the environmental dimension, and the indigenous dimension. So first for economics. Uh, I think that summoning the anti-extractivist subject, the anti-extractivist economic subject, will be very tricky, especially in places where uh, resource extraction is experienced as the basis of material prosperity, national interest, and economic growth. Right? In my country, for example, uh, we have been hailed as subjects of extraction for a very long time, only not as anti-extractivist. In Canada, our entire national mythology is built on a history of extractive industry, fisheries, animal furs, agriculture, timber, minerals, metals, hydroelectricity, and now fossil fuels, in which the harvesting of natural resources for export is presented as the source and guarantee of our economic development and our national identity. So extraction, right, more than canoeing on our great rivers or hiking through our wilderness or playing hockey, on our frozen ponds. Same in these countries. Right, right, 
you, ah, you hear that? <laughs> uh, uh, extraction really has defined the Canadian relationship to nature. So here, for example, is a map produced in 1955 by the Canadian Department of Citizenship and Immigration showing 100, it's kind of small on that screen, but you get the idea, 100 new resources that will help make Canada's future bright and prosperous. And this map really renders the territory of Canada as a geography of extraction and the infrastructures that enable it. It also completely erases the history of settler colonialism, the history of violent and brutal dispossession and extermination of indigenous peoples and species by which Canadian extractive capital came into being, as Marx described of capital born of primitive accumulation more generally, dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. Uh, and here is something more recent. Again, it's very small on this screen, I'm sorry. But this is a flyer produced 60 years later in 2015 by the Ministry of Natural Resources, promoting the contribution of the extractive industries to the Canadian economy in terms of employment, GDP, capital investment, exports, and government, government revenues. And it's against this backdrop, I would say, which is material and not just ideological, that Canadians become subjects of extraction whose livelihoods and standard of living are closely bound to the resource economy. Klein has argued that the material relationship to extraction in affluent countries like Canada will change as extreme forms of extraction proliferate and as the frontiers of extraction uh, increasingly encroach upon the everyday lives of people who up to this point have enjoyed its benefits without really bearing its sacrifices or even seeing them. She has in mind here things like extreme weather events caused by global warming, fracking uh, in, in or near inhabited areas, the transportation of unstable hydrocarbons through sensitive ecosystems and, uh, and cities, and of course media exposure of previously hidden catastrophes. Uh, so that's plausible that, that, that those experiences will change the, the, the relationship that people have to, to the resource economy. But I think it's really an empirical question as to when this point might be reached, such that an anti-extractive subject might be activated. For now, it remains the case that the negative impacts of extraction are quite remote geographically, ideologically, and existentially from the experience of those who benefit from them. And I, it's very small, you can't see it, but I draw your attention to item seven on that list uh, of key facts about Canada's natural resources. That little box at number seven, you can't read it, but it, it shows that roughly 47%, nearly half of the $524 billion in assets held by Canadian companies in the extractive sector are in fact held abroad. Mm -hmm largely in Latin America and in Southeast Asia where Canadian extractive firms are notoriously implicated in abusive environmental and labor practices including forced dispossession of indigenous peoples and violent repression of local opposition, all of which again is intentionally obscured by graphics like this one and which remains a fact that kind of remains far removed from the experience that most Canadians have of their resource economy. Uh, and I think also uh, when considering Klein's suggestion that increasingly direct experience of negative impacts will motivate opposition to extractivism even in the developed countries of the North, uh, uh, when we're considering that proposition, we also have to consider that for many people in these countries, the most negative impact of extractive industry is felt when it goes away. Right? Here I refer to the long history of resource communities in which, though they experience the externalities of extraction on a daily basis, right, the worst thing that could happen, that could possibly happen, is that the mine or the mill or the fishery would suddenly disappear. Right? From one perspective, this is an argument for why economies built on extractive industries are unsustainable. But from another viewpoint, it's also precisely the reason why so many people cling to them so fiercely. And it's telling, I think, for example, that of the three trade unions that have signed the LEAP Manifesto, uh, 
none represent workers in the extractive or resource sectors. Uh, in this same vein, and here we'll, we'll leave Canada for a few minutes, uh, I think we need to take note of the complicated case of the so-called new extractivism in Latin America. Uh, Latin America, of course, has a long history of imperial, colonial, capitalist, and neoliberal extractivist violence and plunder, a dynamic that continues in many countries in Latin America today. As I mentioned earlier, much of it at the hands of Canadian mining companies. But what's most challenging uh, for the politics of anti-extractivism has been the emergence in Latin America of a number of ostensibly left, socialist, or progressive governments, most notably in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, which have committed to extraction and export of nationalized primary resources as a means to finance poverty reduction, improved social services in health, and education, infrastructure, and economic development, and a variety of redistributive programs. Now, left critics of the new extractivism in Latin America have contested the extent of wealth redistribution and structural change under these programs. They point to the continuity of the same wrongs that have always accompanied extraction in Latin America. Right? So things like the parasitic presence of transnational corporations that continue to dominate the extraction sector, massive environmental damage, including the encroachment of extractive activity into protected ecological reserves, the displacement of indigenous population, and again, violent repression of dissent and opposition. And as many Latin American scholars have documented, this has given rise to a struggle in which indigenous peoples, peasant farmers, and landless workers have organized to oppose the assault of new extractivism, as it's called, on the land, water, and commons uh, upon which their survival depends. So this situation would seem to vindicate the anti-extractivist position. Right? Even ostensibly left governments cannot successfully escape the pathologies of extraction. And while that's true, any effort to hail an anti-extractivist subject still has to contend with another experience of extraction in places like Bolivia, right? Whereas, uh, here I'm quoting a, a Latin Americanist named Brett uh, Gustafson. Gustafson writes, day-to-day -day events like the opening of a filling station or the installation of a gas line into urban homes are put on display as signs of revolutionary progress. And since much of Bolivia still carries out the daily search for fire, a daily search for firewood, and housewives stand in long lines to exchange propane tanks to get their cooking done, such a convenience is indeed a sign of change. Right. So it's against this complicated backdrop that uh, left governments uh, in Latin America who invest in the development of new uh, extractivist projects as the material basis of a post-capitalist future sometimes cast indigenous and environmentalist opposition to this program as parochial, as regressive, right? even as they themselves invoked indigenous conceptions of living well right, and respect for the earth in their own visions of a sustainable future. Right? So this is a complicated terrain all of a sudden. At a minimum, there would appear to be a serious tension between the progressive ambitions of left extractivism and its oppressive relationship to indigenous peoples who don't share that ambition. Right? And there's a lot to be contended with in figuring out just where one should come down in that uh, contest in that part of the world. Uh, my point here really is just to, to say that um, as David Harvey has observed in his own attempt to think some of this through in his account of accumulation by dispossession in a slightly earlier period, there appear to be no easy answers to such questions. <laughs> right? uh, Anti-extractivism faces a very complex set of material and historical conditions that are geographically differentiated and can't be easily reduced by the imperative of climate change. If extraction is a wrong, that creates a new anti-extractivist class. It's possible that it does so only by splitting the traditional pro proletariat in two and by assigning the fraction that remains invested in the resource economy to the same side as the capitalists for whom they work and against indigenous people 
who wish to follow a different path. So very complicated. And perhaps this is why, and now I'll move on to the environmental part, right? Perhaps this is why the hail to the anti-extractivist subject seems to require what I call an ontological supplement. And by that I mean an appeal based not on just the material dimensions of the wrong of extraction, but also on the mode of being that it entails. So here we're reminded that in his 1955 memorial address in honor of the composer Konrad Kreutzer, when Heidegger tried to concretize his view of the essence of modern technology as gestell or in framing, he turned to petrochemicals. Right? Under the regime of technology as gestell, he says, nature becomes a gigantic gasoline station, an energy source for modern technology and industry. Energy and extraction were, of course, central to Heidegger's conception of technology as in framing, in which the world is set upon as a standing reserve, a mode of being, he said, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. Under the regime of uh, modern technology, the earth reveals itself, he says, as a coal mining district, the soil as a mineral deposit. So Heidegger's philosophy of technology is thus, at least in part, and maybe at its kind of ultimate uh, expression, a philosophy of extraction. Our relationship to the earth as standing reserve, as mere object at our disposal, not just to be used, but to be used up, in this account denies us of a more original revealing the experience, sorry, denies us of the possibility of experiencing the call of a more primal truth, he says. And this more primal truth becomes available to us only if we relate to the earth other than extractively, if we dwell thankfully, if we dwell poetically, thoughtfully, and let beings including, one presumes, non-human beings, B. Extraction is thus not just a material crisis, it's an ontological crisis and an existential one as well. So here is how Naomi Klein defines extractivism in her book. She says, and this is another uh, long passage, she says, extractivism is a non-reciprocal dominance-based relationship with the earth, one of purely taking, it's the opposite of stewardship, which involves taking, but also taking care that regeneration and future life continue. Extractivism is the mentality of the mountaintop remover and the old growth clear cutter. It is the reduction of life into objects for the use of others, giving them no integrity or value of their own, turning living complex ecosystems into natural resources. It's also the reduction of human beings either into labor to be brutally extracted, pushed beyond limits, or alternatively into social burden, problems to be locked out at borders and locked away in prisons or reservations. In an extractivist economy, the interconnection among these various objectified components of life are ignored. The consequences of severing them are of no concern. So she goes on then to contrast the, what she calls the extractive industry's culture of structural transience with those, and this is again a quotation, deeply rooted people with an intense love of their home place. Right? Now, I don't imagine that Klein or her comrades would describe themselves as Heideggerian. And here she's referring more directly to worldviews that she associates with Canada's indigenous peoples. But it's not so hard to imagine uh, statements such as the one I just read being spoken uh, by the master himself in his hut at Tottenau Berg, albeit with a slightly different vocabulary. Right? And in 2013, when Klein uh, sits down with uh, the uh, venerable Nishna Abeg uh, theorist and activist, that's an indigenous uh, nation in Canada, uh, at, uh, Leanne Simpson, she, Klein, describes extractivism as a mindset, a way of looking at the world, right, that is psychological and cultural and calls for a different relationship with nature based on life-promoting systems and the principle of regeneration. Okay. This, uh, how much time have I got left? Okay, so that's perfect. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, Conversion or this conversation was uh, evidently formative 
for uh, the final sections of Klein's book in which she makes a plea for living non-extractively. Right? And she says this does not mean that extraction does not happen, but it does mean the end of the extractive mindset. Uh, in this same, it's the same spirit that informs key passages in the Leap Manifesto, which is framed as a call for uh, a Canada based on caring for the earth and for one another that would constrain out of control industrial activity and establish an economy in balance with the earth's limits. So this kind of existential or ontological appeal to the environmental dimension of the political subject of extraction, I think, also raises as many questions as it answers, right? And perhaps the first is whether a change in the extractive mindset entails corresponding change in the material comfort of those societies that have benefited most from extractivism. Klein's indigenous interlocutor, Leanne Simpson, is very clear on this point. She says, in order to make these changes, in order to make this punctuated transformation, it means lower standards of living for the 1% and for the middle class. At the end of the day, that's what it means. So this bit of decidedly non-romantic indigenous wisdom doesn't make it into Klein's book, right? which explicitly avoids any talk of rolling back the material comforts of modernity, even as it promotes and expli an explicitly non or anti-modern mindset. Hmm? In the Leap Manifesto, and I'll finish here, uh, we find uh, a universal program to build energy efficient homes and retrofitting existing housing. We find high speed rail powered by renewables. We find affordable public transit, massive investment in the rehabilitation of decaying public infrastructure massive investment in job training, all with the assurances that technological breakthroughs have brought this dream within reach, and a promise that caring for one another and caring for the planet could be the economy's fastest growing sectors. So, so if you're thinking that this doesn't sound very much like a lower standard of living uh, uh, for the middle class or an existential leap to a new non-technological, non-extractive, non-growth oriented way of being in the world, then you would probably be right. The anti-extractive subject of the existential leap to a more careful relationship to the earth apparently needs to be reassured that things will not change that much after all. Uh, this probably sort of saves anti-extractivism from being consigned to that category of, kind of non-progressive, regressive responses uh, to uh, accumulation by dispossession. It's certainly strategically wise, right, in a context where the working class doesn't want to hear about uh, uh, sacrifice and the middle class doesn't want to hear about degrowth. Um, an end to extractivism would certainly uh, transform life under capitalism in meaningful ways, but the question remains as to whether capitalism might not be able to accommodate and even profit from an anti-extractivism expressed primarily in terms of a mindset. Right? So I'll end with this, just last week, uh, when U.S. Uh, Secretary of State John Kerry announced that the Obama administration would bow to the pressure of the climate movement and deny permission for the Keystone XL pipeline, he issued a kind of hail of his own. He said, clean energy is not just the solution to climate change, it's also one of the greatest economic opportunities the world has ever seen. If we continue to make smart choices, American business and American workers stand to benefit enormously. And I think it's a safe bet that upon hearing this, many people indeed turned around and recognized themselves in that hail. I'll stop there. Okay.